Welcome to the Art of Change podcast, where we take a look at the latest news and events happening throughout the Arts Division at UC Santa Cruz. I'm your host, Maureen Dixon Harrison, and I'm the Assistant Director of Communications and Marketing here at UC Santa Cruz's Arts Division. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Superwoman Isabel Dietz, the Associate Vice Chancellor, Equity and Equal Protection at UC Santa Cruz. And now, sit back for a very lively conversation with the amazing Isabel Dees. So my parents came here um, before I was born, and I, we lived in Southern California in the San Fernando Valley. And, um, and then uh, I'm the oldest of five kids, um, and my mom had... Um, a really rough time in her third pregnancy, like being alone and away from family. So we moved back to Mexico and I did like kindergarten, first, second and third grade there um, before we returned. Um, and that was really um, like important for me because um, from the very beginning, knowing that there's more than one way of learning things mm. and a different way of like structuring information or approaching learning um, was a super early lesson, right? And normally like in elementary school, everything your teacher says is like gospel. Like that is, that is how to do it, the only way to do it, right? There's possibilities of being or ways of being. And one of the reasons I love the arts is because whether it's through dance or through literature or through storytelling and why this is fun is that like each story is a kind of exploration and ways of being. Um, and uh, for compliance and for community, um, I feel like that creative, methodology right it's like it's an inquiry but it's like a methodology like let's explore being through this storytelling let's explore implementation um or procedure as being as a creative endeavor and like that really invites participation that invites engagement that invites creativity the immigrant experience isn't like homogenous um, and so, and so again, like enriching those different experiences that like, that was my experience, but that's not everybody's experience was immediately challenged, right? Um, things like, like I remember, so I went to a bilingual school in Mexico and I wasn't completely without English skills when I started school here, but it wasn't like, mm, like, fluent or native language choices very early on had like a, a value and appreciation and language has also been that for me it's not just a new howling mm -hmm. uh, right but also like new words to express the how also inform what's possible Right. And so, so knowing that howing is iterative, again, is kind of like a lesson in my bones that I kind of grew up with. And I feel like that's part of, part of being, growing up in an immigrant household. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like I mentioned, our family history um, has like a few journeys back and forth across the border, it means that my, the status within my family is mixed. So those issues of like, papers, no papers, um, yeah. like, you know, is, is, is a mixed experience between household members. You know, my sister is faculty at Brown now, and my other sister is a court evaluator for, um, like family court. And, you know, we're like all a, a family of underachievers, <laughs> <laughs> like it's just, but all with like a deep sense of like service yeah. and a deep sense of community. The way I came to be at UCSE mm -hmm. is both like I wanted to be far enough away from home that I could have a space of my own to explore myself and to without like family obligation or judgment. It was like it was like magical, like very magical, like wow. really, like you all, this is like a summer camp experience, like, <laughs> well, I can see <laughs> yeah. Bambi, like, uh -huh. 
like mm-hmm. y'all like where are these are props right like <laughs> who let the deer out like just as I was walking through here right and, yeah. and it's just like really like literally breathtaking the beauty here the natural beauty is really really amazing and there was a like a little part of me that um not a little like it was I'm like a transcendental moment almost like oh my gosh it's gorgeous here and then like that little there there is a part of me that was like oh but is it for me mm. right and then thinking about like well who is this experience meant for um and having some like doubt about whether like is this a place for for a brown girl like me but but that questioning as being really resonated with me mm-hmm and the idea of like even in the late 90s early 2000s like social justice was was a theme Mm -hmm. um student activism has always been a thing here right and really importantly like the role of personal choice and agency Mm -hmm. in informing um like community standards and enforcing right like right um, and and holding community members accountable has always resonated with me, mm-hmm. right? And so so both so that also informed all my thinking around kind of um, like how to explore being as an adult, mm-hmm. right? How how to contribute meaningfully um, in community and in society, um, how to um, like connect uh, deeply with kind of those, that internal knowledge, right? Like the more time I spent in the forest, the more I felt like entitled to being connected with the earth, Mm -hmm. right? Like, again, that was, it almost felt like, like ancestral, like to get super corny, right? Like, oh, like I do belong, I'm here, I do belong here. Like this is, this is, you know, yep, I'm gonna be communing with nature here. Like, <laughs> oh wow, I am that cliche. But it felt, um, it felt honest. It felt real. It felt like true. And um, you know, at times it feels isolating. But also, I come back to the truth of that, right? That like connecting with nature. I'm connecting with myself, with my history, with like community. It, it feels ancestral. It it feels mm-hmm. right. What steps did you take to, to yeah. feel more part of the community here? Um, I don't, you know, I don't think I did that super successfully as an undergrad, which is why it took me longer to graduate than, mm-hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, than expected or than traditionally and I don't think that I ever quite did assimilate or fit in and instead what I developed was um like like when I first connected with Celine we had this chat about like what is it like to live in Santa Cruz and it was the first time I was sort of able to put words to it Mm -hmm. but it's almost like just being here like existing and being present is an act of resistance. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. So feeling like I don't belong and instead of asking to belong Mm -hmm. or seeking to um, join the center is sticking out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I'm going to be here and I'm going to stick out. And to get used to it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I like that. (laughs) Right. It's almost like, um, like I don't, I, you don't need to accept me for me to belong. I am here. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That should be enough. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, and it felt like, I think in, in the, in the time I definitely had that kind of it felt like in rebeldia, like I was being a rebel, right? Like it felt mm-hmm. like a little like like mischief making. <laughs> um, and and um, and I thought, oh, I'll grow out of that, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> right, right. I I deepened that, and that became that informed um, like the choices yeah, that I made. That's wonderful. Right? And, uh, and like, I mean, you know, I want to acknowledge my privilege too. That like. The, my level of education and also my skin tone like I, I I pass in 
in certain spaces. Um, I am considered white within Latino community, right? And so, um, and so I, I want to acknowledge that and also that like, um, that the howing, that the, the being um, that I, for me is very much um, rooted uh, in that, in that kind of resisting assimilation and mm -hmm. instead grounding in community. I spent a lot of times in the beach flats. I spent a lot of time um, in Watsonville. I spent a lot of time um, just even downtown. Um, like whenever I'd go to restaurants, I'd ask like to be seated by the door to the kitchen so that I could hear the music, oh, so that no. I could hear like people, like I had to make concerted efforts to hear people speaking Spanish, mm -hmm. where in my community, it was at home, it was everywhere. And at the university, it was not, that's not the dominant language. And there aren't like exclusively monolingual spaces. And so getting out into the community where it could be heard, mm -hmm. um, where the smells could happen. So mm -hmm. I ended up doing like, um, working for a nonprofit doing after school tutorial and like youth enrichment programs yeah. and it was really lovely to do outreach within the community in that program mm -hmm. because then whenever I'd walk through that community like families having you know barbecues outside would say hello and offer me a taco or like you know I'd see families out downtown and the kids would be like oh hey and so i I went where I could see people that looked and sounded like me and sought to kind of strengthen those community ties. There are things you feel pressure to like, this is what it looks like to perform. Mm -hmm. um, like co collegial um, participation, right? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. does everyone have a laptop? Am I the only person taking hand notes here? How right. do I get a laptop? Um, does everyone like I, you know, everyone's on the social media, I don't have a smartphone, I have a plain mm -hmm. ass phone um, that I can use for making emergency calls, because that's the kind of plan that I can afford, right. And so like, what do I miss out on? Because I'm not like, there on the group chat or I'm not there uh, for like the way this is being live tweeted or, or whatever the case might be or um, you know um, I, I can't zoom in uh, because I share a room with three other people and we all have class at the same time so I'm not trying to not participate but like we have to negotiate who's going to speak when so that we're not interrupting each other's classes right um, like headsets cost money right? right so there's all of these all of these things that in addition to like the cost of like um, minimal access mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. what what does college student performance what does that performance look like what is like you know mm -hmm. like in the arts like how would you um like, what is the costume for that? Like, how many outfits do I need to have before you're worried about whether I did my laundry or not? Like, what, you know, like, what is the stigma or fear of um, judgment that I need to have or not, right? Um, like, or do I need to, like, preemptively adopt a like well I don't care what you think um not because I don't want to build community but because that's my protective strategy for yeah. anticipating the kind of judgment that I won't that I cannot afford not to subject myself to right and so there are all these like yeah. subtle things that whether it's um conscious or not students in different socioeconomic statuses, students of a different class or caste, students from, you know, underrepresented communities who don't know what to expect, right? Yeah. And so they, they, um, they imagine um, expectations and prepare, you know, you need a certain kind of armor, like you got to be ready. And, um, and it's a, it's a big deal to ask folks to be vulnerable, right? And so even like that whole first year, like not since kindergarten, a, will you be my friend is an acceptable social strategy, except in like that first quarter and really like yeah. those first five weeks yeah. of class, right? And so folks come with a lot of expectations, folks come with um, a lot of 
fear, a lot of uh, preconceived notions about what those first five weeks are going to be about and what they need in order to be successful and a lot of fear about what they'll miss out on. Mm -hmm. and how that will inform the rest of their college experience. And who do you ask, you know, and you don't want to feel like you don't, you know, again, you don't fit in or you're dumb, you know, or you're, you're not intelligent or you don't, you know, know what to do that. That's really, you know, talk about vulnerability when you, when it seems like everybody else just automatically knows what to do, you know. And with your office, what do you think makes um, the approach to DEI distinctive? Yeah, so my office is, so equity and equal protection. Our scope is not necessarily diversity, equity, and inclusion mm. um, as a body of work, right? So uh, DEI is about um, climate and community. Mm -hmm. And the compliance office is about accountability. And um, while I think accountability is an important community act, it's the floor. <laughs> it's the least, right? Like compliance plays a critical role in that. Now, that being said, um, I'm also an office, a university office, right? Mm -hmm. And so making mm -hmm. sure that um, that I am not holding folks to standards that I'm not holding myself to mm -hmm. is really critical, mm -hmm. right? Like that's part of doing the work in a manner that's authentic, making sure that I'm using um, developmental hiring practices um, that are fair and equitable, making sure that um, I'm working on um, professional development and support so that folks have opportunity from within to grow, making sure that I'm attentive to representation um, on my team and within my staff, but um, also uh, that as I'm recruiting, that I'm not using weird words that are not plainly understood, mm -hmm. um, that I'm hosting informational sessions to help folks kind of translate between their existing skill set and the skill set I'm learning and ask questions about, well, what does that mean? Oh, well, I do this. Let's talk about how that's similar. Let's talk about how that's different so that they have a chance to be successful kind of in the interview process. Um, putting myself out there to participate in career fairs or like just yeah. job talks so folks can even consider the possibility that like this could be a career path and making sure that there's wide representation of experiences in investigators in compliance has an impact on how those rules are applied and like against whom, for example, right? So we, we hear a lot about like disproportionate impact both in misconduct against vulnerable communities, but also in allegations against men of color, brown bodies, right? Um, and so making sure that that perspective, uh, that there's equity in application of rules or attention to perhaps the impact of implicit bias in reporting, that that's part of what we're considering as we're developing processes, like that matters. The application of DEI principles to compliance, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. is, yeah. is really important. And that's something that like, again, the, that the DEI offices, like ODEI or that my office, like we are not um, exempt from community standards. If someone, if you, if you feel yeah. like the person responding to your concern um, has a, a shared interest or someone on the team could speak up for or understand where you're coming from, you're more likely to experience the process as fair. Mm -hmm. um, we're more likely to actually be fair because there's a diversity of perspective on the team as we're discussing um, through, through the issues. Um, what do you think about the importance of having leaders, you know, in what you're doing in DEI who are people of color, you know, and, and what a difference that makes to the, to all of us, to the overall. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like that's, I mean, I feel like that's a really challenging question, right? Because, um, 
like the work of diversity, the work of addressing systemic racism cannot be the burden of people of color alone, yeah. right? Um, yeah. it, it feels um, like unsound to say, the folks that are excluded, it is your job to tell us how, to, how we should include you. Mm -hmm. It is your job to fix the system that excludes you. It is your job to chart a path towards the center. Um, that's rough, right? And at the same time, we don't, we don't want to reimagine community. We don't want to reimagine structures that exclude mm -hmm. or duplicate the same kinds of ex exclusionary practices and systems that mm -hmm. are currently in place. Um, and so that's um, like, you know, I don't have the answer uh, mm -hmm. for, for which it is, but I do think it's really important to have diversity in leadership, right? Like the, the way that I describe that I, like my approach to compliance, that's what my leadership looks like. And being willing to, to acknowledge um, that how, that being, that way of being as leadership, mm -hmm. Right? Like that's not just me doing my job. That is how I leadership. Um, and and saying that's leadership um, matters, right? Like right. that leadership doesn't just look a certain way. Yes, when someone's confident and comes in and says, here's what we're doing, um, because that's what the policy says, that's one way of implementing and one way of leadership. Mm. And and then, uh, and calling it leadership is great, but expecting that that's the only way of doing it, or that if you're not doing that way, you aren't performing leadership, um, perpetuates exclusion, right? And so like one, one benefit of having diversity in leadership is that that how is gonna look different. I also wanted to get back to your knitting and um, if, if you could talk about how knitting is part of your leadership and part of DEI. Um, so, I mean, I know it's, it's super silly, but I think of knitting um, as part of DEI in like a couple of ways. Um, knitting is part of a community tradition. Um, somebody teaches you to do it. Um, it's not isolated. There's a history to it. I've never met anyone that doesn't have a personal narrative or relationship to either the, the yarn, the, um, the experience of knitting, of observing someone within their family or community knit. Um, uh, I love, like my mom used to always look at me and if I was like sitting, she'd be like, you know, haz algo útil, do something useful. <laughs> and so the idea of having something in my hands, like even as I sit, yeah. Um, like it's, I'm being useful I'm being like productive with my hands. And so, so I, I see knitting as always invoking a community history and a shared experience. Um, I also see it as invitational. Um, I've never been in a space knitting where someone hasn't asked me about it. What are you making? How long have you been knitting? Do yeah. you knit often? Right. And so it invites conversation. Um, it's also one of those activities that like crosses the midpoint. So you're using both sides of your brain while you do it. Mm -hmm. And there's like um, good research on how that is therapeutic for addressing different kinds of trauma, for supporting memory, uh, for supporting focus. And so, um, you know, many, many um, forms of harassment and discrimination are a kind of trauma. And so engaging in a holistic healing practice that invokes community and invites engagement for me is also a way to um, address the trauma and the human impact that this work has, the personal impact that this has. And so it's a way of also being vulnerable, right? Like it's, it's a healing, it's a healing self-practice for me and to do it openly. Um, is to acknowledge uh, and being willing to talk about like, yeah, it has an impact. Uh, folks aren't, don't feel like they're being ignored uh, if they learn that I'm better able to focus on what's being said. If I've got, if mm -hmm. I've got a ta like a alternative task that's, yeah. right, that is repetitive uh, to, to quiet all the rest of the things so I can focus on what's being said. So. Oh, I love it. I think it's very warm and comforting and very humanizing. 
<laughs> we can have that at work. <laughs> you know, right? Even if we're in an office, we can have that. We can certainly have it at an academic institution where we're we're dealing with all kinds of people and most importantly our students, you know. Yeah. So I think that's just really wonderful that you do that. I'm very inspired. I might have to get back to doing it now myself. Well, I just want to thank you so much. We're, we're coming to the end of our time. And it was just, I could talk to you all day, but we have to cut it off. Um, so maybe we'll have a part two, three, four, <laughs> or we're checking every year or something. Well, I'd love to check in every year. And also my team is awesome. Oh, wouldn't that be fun to have them on sometime? Let's, yeah, let's plan something. That would be really fun. But thank you oh, so yeah, much. They all have superpowers. So. Oh, yeah, I love that. I, yeah, I'm down. I'm down with the superpowers. You get inspired by all that. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Oh, well, thanks. Take care and enjoy your knitting and um, have a great rest of your week. You too. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for viewing the Art of Change video podcast. We look forward to having you join us for future episodes. If you'd like more information about the UC Santa Cruz Arts Division, please visit arts.ucsc.edu. See you next time.